Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is the 29th of January, 2019. Happy Tuesday to everyone. My name's Harrison Smith, sitting in once again for David Knight. Lots of stuff to talk about today. Uh, the, of course, we're going to get into the Starbucks CEO, Howard Schultz, announcing his run for presidency, as well as the rest of the equally ridiculous 2020 uh, entire uh, field there. We're going to see him heckled within 30 seconds of his opening speech as he announces uh, his presidency, as well as, of course, the new State of the Union has been uh, determined what date that will occur on. Just lots of big news from all over the place. But first, I want to hear from Mr. John Bowne. The socialist Marxist anti-American Democrats want you to know they think they have the moral high ground. Do we live in a moral world that allows for billionaires? Is that a moral outcome in and no, of itself? Mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. But do they even know where the moral high ground is? Pelosi is knee-deep in immorality. She just entered the history books as the first speaker of the House in U.S. history to cancel the president's State of the Union address, censoring our duly elected president's overview of the direction of the country is so overwhelmingly totalitarian. I don't think it has sunk in yet with the majority of the country just how wrong and essentially immoral Nancy Pelosi's cancellation of the State of the Union really is. Every two years years, we gather in this chamber for a sacred ritual under the dome of this temple of democracy, the capital of the United States, we renew the great American experiment. And up next, we have uh, Representative Nancy Pelosi, first woman speaker of the House. She has spent more than a quarter century in Congress breaking barriers and promoting equal rights for all Americans. As speaker, she famously led the fight for And you know, she was one of the people who got that money here when I talked about in the 80s, San Francisco having a bigger AIDS budget than the federal government had. Meanwhile, the family unit is torn apart by creeping Marxism, dealt yet another blow by the Democrats' rush to equalize everything while trampling the way in which what's left of the United States' traditional moral code. While on the surface, the Equality Act appears as a civil rights victory, gender-related identity inclusion aside, what was regarded as immoral behavior will be gradually accepted. I'll quote Dr. King. Dr. King said, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Tranquilizing gradualism. We cannot think incrementally. We have to think big. And the Equality Act updates the definitions of sex to include a sex stereotype, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Sexual orientation will now be defined as homosexuality, heterosexuality, or bisexuality. Gender identity will be defined as appearance, mannerisms, or characteristics, regardless of the individual's designated sex at birth. The Equality Act also prohibits an establishment from being construed to be limited to a physical facility or place. Meaning, if you thought the Catholic priest rape epidemic was bad, just wait until pedophile access to our children is increased and pedophilia is eventually deemed acceptable by the government. And scenes like this will be commonplace. Okay. I'm a ma'am. I'm a ma'am. My ID say female. He's being yeah. rude. Know your pronouns. Know your pronouns. Get out, know your pronouns. A transgender woman who recently started her transition yelling at an employee inside this Albuquerque GameStop. Moore says the cashier repeatedly called her sir instead of the gender pronoun she identifies with. While she was trying to return a game she bought for her son. Ma'am, once again, ma'am. I said both of you. No, you said sir. Once again, it's man. I actually said both of you guys. Right beforehand, you f***ing said, sir. The definition of the family will be overhauled, just as Pelosi and her immoral California Silicon Valley cohorts want it to be. There are two challenges, uh, well, actually three, that I want to just close with. And that is, are the, these are the, these, here they are. <laughs> is there anything more immoral than subverting the strong moral foundation of the family? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Harrison Smith sitting in once again for David Knight on this Tuesday, the 29th of January, 2019. 
I'm still stapling together stories here as I lay out my spread of, uh, of news to deliver to you fine folks on this uh, blisteringly cold Tuesday morning. In fact, some of the numbers are, are just jaw-dropping. Negative 60 with the wind chill in Minneapolis. Negative 60. I literally cannot even comprehend that. It, it makes me want to start believing in climate change. Of course, uh, President Trump had a hilarious tweet about that yesterday where he says, come back, global warming, we need you. Let me just give you, give you a scope of what I'm looking at in front of me. I'm just going to start reading headlines for you because sometimes that's just the best way to understand what's going on. Hundreds of migrants cross Arizona border after, quote, several busloads dropped off in Mexico. Hmm. Bus loads. Wonder who's paying for that. Apparently Trump, and this is not a headline from The Onion, believe it or not. This headline is from The Hill. In fact, there's, there's two of them. Let me see if I can find the other one. Here you go. This one's from Mediaite. These two headlines. Trump tells White House visitors that Obama, quote, watched a basketball all day in dining room. <laughs> Trump reportedly keeps showing White House guests where Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky had sex. These are two real headlines, which I don't know if they're true, but I might be visiting the White House soon. That sounds like the most hilarious White House tour of all time. Why am I not surprised? Nancy Pelosi has, uh, has stepped down from her golden throne as leader of one half of one half of one third of the government to bestow upon we the people the right to hear from our duly elected president and have uh, they have worked together to negotiate on February 5th as being the day that he will deliver the State of the Union address. We have the letter from him. Now, I have a story from two days ago saying the U.S. economy lost at least $6 billion during the shutdown, meaning that we lost more during the shutdown than we would have paid for the wall. Do you think liberals will think, hey, you know what, maybe we should have just paid for the damn wall? No, no, that's not how they think. And in fact, the numbers coming out now from the Congressional Budget Office are saying that almost twice as much as the wall cost is what we lost during the uh, shutdown in economic uh, productivity. So we could have had two walls, two walls for the amount that it cost for Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to uh, suck their thumbs and, and try to shame us like a bunch of uh, I don't know, decrepit vampires. Venezuela, obviously, uh, the, the big story today, uh, the, the evil mustache himself came out and uh, t uh, Bolton came out and talked about nothing, nothing in particular, uh, vagaries about what, would we, uh, what could be done in Venezuela. Said there's no plan in place, but accidentally, you may say, his paper, his notepad that he was looking at had the words 5,000 troops to Colombia scribbled on it. So uh, whether that was just an accident or whether he was sending a message, uh, it seems like we will, we will now be sending troops to Colombia uh, to stage there in case intervention is required in Venezuela. You know, I have a theory that says that uh, basically Iran is giving Venezuela to the neocons as sort of a consolation prize now that he's pulling them out of Iran. That's my own interpretation of the, uh, of the idea. Still no word from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg went into surgery for lung cancer on December 21st, and nobody has seen her since. Nobody in the media, anyway. Nobody in the public. There is some strange speculation going on, some pictures posted that purport to be from inside her hospital uh, room. And, and somebody either, I mean, they could be LARPing, they could be pretending, uh, but the, <laughs> what they're saying is that basically she is being kept in an uh, 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 artificially created coma. And we don't know if that's true or not, but we don't know anything about what she's doing. So, you know, speculation is all we have. There's a story on Infowars.com. Where's Ruth? Internet seeks proof of life as RBG goes missing. Uh, look, folks. Donald Trump is going to be able to nominate uh, almost half the Supreme Court himself. Uh, this is amazing. 
this is means that uh, there will be conservatives on the court overseeing government for generations. You have no idea how close we were to the end with Hillary Clinton getting elected president and putting in hardcore liberals onto that court would have been the death knell and is possibly the most important aspect of Donald Trump's presidency thus far has been his ability to get conservatives on the Supreme Court. But we don't know where Ruth Bader Ginsburg is. We'll keep looking out for her for you. Now, the California Board of Trustees has scrapped the Pledge of Allegiance over its, quote, white nationalism history. So we'll get into that. But yes, these are cultural terrorists, cultural predators. They are attacking the very foundation of our nation, and they aren't even hiding it anymore. A U.S. judge is going to allow controversial evidence in the Roundup cancer trials. So we'll get into that against uh, Bayer's glyphosate-based Roundup weed killer causing cancer. Uh, the, those uh, court cases are ongoing, so we'll get into that a little bit. Interesting story that lines up with what I've been saying for a very long time. This headline is Chinese investment into Kenya is reportedly bringing racism and discrimination along with it. Folks, China is actively and aggressively colonizing Africa, subjugating its people and extracting its resources at an industrial scale that not only dwarfs anything, I mean, nothing even remotely close to the scale that they are doing this ever existed with Western colonialism or European colonialism. Not only that, but, you know, say what you will about colonialism, and I think it's clearly evil. The idea of a foreign country going into a poorer country and dominating it and extracting resources and subjugating its people. Clearly evil, clearly not good. However, at least when the Europeans did it, they brought Christianity along and at least had to, had to cover it with the veil of respectability and said, no, no, we're helping them. We're helping them uh, by subjugating them. You know, at least, at least they... They tried to pretend that's, that that's what they were doing. You get no such courtesy with the Chinese, my friends. They are ruthless, and they are acting ruthlessly in Africa right now. And, you know, they're not white, so it's fine. Nobody even cares. Nobody even talks about it. It's, it's inexcusable, but that's what's going on. Of course, we have just a whole litany of articles about mental health. Oh, but here's the good news. Scientists are working on a pill for loneliness. Oh, do you feel lonely? There's no cure for that. There's no way to have you stop feeling lonely. It's not like there's a cure, uh, you know, one foot outside your house. It's not like you can go out and meet people and cure your loneliness by making friends, by interactions with humanity, by getting off the internet and going and, and forging bonds with other human beings. No, no, just take a pill. Why don't you just take a pill to stop feeling lonely? Because, because this is, because this is the, what they want you to think the reality of mental health is, is that, oh, if you feel that something's wrong in your brain, that, that something in your life is not living up to your expectations or something in your life is making you feel sad, don't change that. Don't try to identify the root cause and make a change. No, no, just take a pill. You know, the reason you have a headache is because you have a Tylenol deficiency, right? I mean, that's what these people want you to think. That, you know, if you're, if you're depressed, well, it's because you aren't taking, you know, the, the, the newly advertised antidepressant. Now, I'm not discounting all mental health, but this is evil. A, sign, a, a pill for loneliness? Loneliness is a natural way to feel when you're alone. The cure, ladies and gentlemen, isn't a pill. It's making friends. Yes, that's right. This is the obvious report. This is the common sense report coming to you live from InfoWars. Stay tuned, folks. Lots of big news ahead. Folks, I didn't even get through half of the headlines that I have for you in that last segment. I mean, an Israeli scientist says they think they found a cure for cancer. I got all sorts of speculation about that. A Chinese activist has been jailed for five years uh, in China. Of course, this comes on the uh, tale of uh, Huawei, Huawei, the number one uh, phone company in China. Their CEO has been imprisoned in Canada and now uh, 
uh, America is uh, bringing charges against her and against that company. Uh, big, you know, conflict there. I have a, I have a BuzzFeed article that's going to be very fun to get through. In the last segment, I was talking about the loneliness pill. And the crew chimes in, and Kyle goes, the loneliness pill, it comes, the, the, your first dose comes free with the purchase of your sex robot. And I, I mean, you laugh at it, but there's something so incredibly depressing about the idea of sex robots and, and happiness pills and loneliness pills. I mean, this is a dystopia that, that Aldous Huxley would have, you know, wouldn't even have appeared in his nightmares. But here we are living it, reporting it to you, you fine folk who I know understand the, the insanity that's coming at us. And the craziest thing is a lot of people see all these headlines and just think, oh, that's nice. Isn't that, oh, a pill for, you know, it's good. Those lonely people won't be lonely anymore. They don't see what's going on. They don't understand that our very humanity is being destroyed, that our connections to human beings are being replaced with pharmaceuticals and robots. We are being deconstructed at a societal level, at a civilizational level, and at just a human level. We are being de uh, separated from each other, atomized, individualized, because it makes us easier to control. And, and if, if, you can just, if you can just put a pill in your mouth and cure that, that uh, you know, uncomfortableness that you feel or, or cure that, that thing that makes you go, hey, you know, these liberals sure are attacking us. These liberals sure do hate us. You know, I, I sure am upset with the way the world is going right now. Eh, don't do anything to fix it. Take a pill. The problem is you, not the world. The problem is you, so you need to take a pill and rewire your brain. It's just insane what's going on in the world. And like I said, I was halfway through my articles. I haven't even stapled the second half. It, it's, it's, there's almost too much to talk about, but, uh, you know, if I stop talking about talking about it, then I'll actually be able to talk about it. So I want to talk about Venezuela. I want to talk about the military option in Venezuela. Of course, this has uh, come under fire from people like Ron Paul, who very rightly points out that this is just another mess in South America or Central America that America goes into and tries to exert our influence, tries to guarantee their democracy, and it always ends up getting us in trouble and being just a symptom of our imperialism. I'm sort of torn about it. Uh, from the stuff I'm hearing on the ground, from the stuff I'm hearing uh, people in Venezuela or people who are familiar with the situation on an uh, you know, uh, individual, personal level, they say that you know, this guy Maduro is a total uh, you know, uh, uh, despot, tyrant. He needs to be overthrown. I generally agree. I just, reserve, I, I just have my uh, reservations about America being involved anywhere else in the world that it isn't already exercising our imperial might. Uh, you know, again, I, I, I said last time, I think my theory is that this is almost a distraction for the neocons to get them away from Iran as Trump tries to pull us out of Syria. Yesterday, I talked about the single base still in Syria that Israel is demanding America stay. Uh, and so that's that's putting a, uh, a wheel in the spokes of our removing ourselves from Syria also gives, um, you know, gives lie to the fact that uh, they say that we are in there to fight ISIS. And then they're saying, no, you can't leave because really we need to keep Syria destabilized for our own machinations on the world stage. Now, another reason I do not like the idea of going into Venezuela is because old man mustache is the one leading the charge. That's John Bolton, who is a, uh, he's a push broom with a warmonger attached to it. And this is him giving a, a little conversation with the uh, press uh, yesterday about invading Venezuela. Uh, let's take a look at that now, and I'll give a little breakdown on it on the other side. We also today call on the Venezuelan military and security forces to accept the peaceful, democratic, and constitutional transfer of power. I call on all responsible nations to recognize interim President Guaido immediately. Maduro has made clear he will not recognize Guaido or call for new elections. Now is the time to stand for democracy and prosperity in Venezuela. Uh, Ambassador Bolton, if I could, you mentioned the word significant response. How do you define significant response? 
well, we're not going to define it because we want the Venezuelan security forces to know how strongly we think that President Guaido, the National Assembly, the opposition, and most importantly, American personnel are not harmed. This is an unequivocal statement on our part. Is there any circumstance under which American forces would get involved? Look, the President has made it very clear on this, uh, uh, on this matter that all options are on the table. So all options are on the table, uh, which includes sending troops. Oh, but he unequivocally says that we will not let Americans be injured or killed in the conflict. Well, I see a conflict between those two statements. Uh, I see a problem here when you're sending in uh, troops to overthrow a government. Yeah, there's going to be a little bit of bloodshed, Mr. Bolton. Now, I'm not sure if it showed it there, but... Uh, cameras in the room caught images of his uh, notepad there, and it said, you know, scribbled on there, 5,000 troops to Colombia. That's the note spotted on John Bolton's pad as he warns that all options are on the table. Apparently, we are sending 5,000 troops to Colombia to stage there in uh, preparation for what I can only imagine would be an invasion of Venezuela. Uh you know, Maduro is trying to hang on to his, uh, to his power there. He is arresting dissidents by the dozens. Uh, but one person he is not touching is his opponent. And this is, you know, obviously, obviously Maduro is scared. He, in fact, was stymied in a bid to pull out $1.2 billion of gold from the U.K., Nicolas Maduro's embattled Venezuelan regime, desperate to hold on to the dwindling cash pile it has abroad, was stymied in its bid to pull $1.2 billion worth of gold out of the Bank of England, according to people familiar with the matter. The Bank of England's decision to deny Maduro's officials, uh, officials' request comes after top U.S. officials, including Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and John Bolton, lobbied their U.K. counterparts to help cut off the regime from its overseas assets according to one of the people who asked not to be identified. So once again, you know, you kind of find yourself in this situation where you go, all right, well, you know, it's not right that the U.S. and the uh, U.K. are conspiring together to deny uh, a country's ruler of that country's assets. That seems like imperial behavior to me. And on the other hand, you say it's definitely not right that a despotic communistic ruler of a country you spins, you know, just just lavishly gives away and spins all of his country's reserves to desperately stay in power. So, you know, as much as I hate to side with John Bolton and bankers in the U.S. and England, they are putting the pressure on Maduro as he tries to spend the wealth of his people and just waste the vast wealth of his country on his own ego and his own power trip. So good riddance, Maduro. Folks. This is not a, an American awakening that's going on. It is based in American ideals because America is where the Western ideals really found their crystallization, found their home, found their true embodiment in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. Uh, and, you know, it was not long. It was barely a decade until that fever had spread to France and led to the revolution there. And just like happened in the late 1700s, the revolution once again begins here in America. Of course, you could argue it began uh, in Brexit or in uh, Britain with Brexit and that movement uh, for freedom there. But, you know, as, as the rest of the world says, they say America sneezes and the rest of the world gets a cold. It starts in America and it, and it spreads throughout the rest of, uh, of the world. And, of course, we have the Yellow Vest Revolution in France. Act 11 took place this last weekend, uh, one of the most brutal things to have happened in the entire history of the protest, that one of their uh, primary leaders has been shot in the face and uh, I believe lost an eye or at least lost vision in his eye, permanently, irrevocably damaged from a flash ball, which is a quote-unquote non-lethal, or as they say now, less than lethal, projectile fired from a gun of a uh, French officer smacked him in the head and uh, permanently disfigured him, permanently handicapped him. So, folks, this is no longer a protest. This is a war, 
It's a, it's a slow burn war, but it is a civil war nevertheless. You also had competing uh, uh, protest going on called the Red Scarf Movement. It's supposed to be a, uh, you know, a counter protest to the yellow vest. Basically people saying, oh, just calm down. Just stop fighting back. Just let the globalist kill you. Just let them drive you out of your ancestral homeland. Let them replace you with lower wage workers so they can continue to fill their bank accounts. Why are you acting up when teacher says no? Totally cowardly, totally just, it it is amazing to me that you have people, you have them here in the United States, you have them in France, you have them all over the world who march in favor of their own destruction. I mean, here in Austin, outside the courthouse, you had people marching in favor of Mueller, saying, don't fire Mueller. And I walked around asking them, are, are you not marching on behalf of the spy state? Is this what you do? So it's, it's, it's amazing to me that this happens. But, you know, no matter how many red scarf people go out, Europe is going up in flames. And our very own Jake Lloyd reports on this. 30 writers have declared in a manifesto published in The Guardian that Europe as an idea is coming apart before our very eyes. You can probably glean from that statement alone which direction this article is taking, but in order to dispel any confusion, they state, we must now will Europe or perish beneath the waves of populism. It's no secret exactly who would be worried about perishing under waves of populism, but this statement reeks of intellectualism and elitism in a much, much deeper way. The key here is looking at Europe as merely a set of principles. It's an idea. It's an ideology. It's a way of thinking. It's political liberalism. But the the average European, the average bartender, the store clerk, cashier, waitress, garbage man, they don't have the luxury of thinking of Europe in such terms. They think of Europe as the place where they live, where they work, where their families live, the place where they pay exorbitant taxes to. They don't have the time or the luxury of thinking about Europe as an idea. The article goes on to state, Europe will be lost to those who still believe in the legacy of Erasmus, Dante, Goethe, and Comenius. Again, does the average European have the luxury or the time to worry about what Erasmus would think about what they're eating for dinner or what Goethe would think about their inability to pay their bills because of the exorbitant gas taxes that they're having to pay? Likely not. They claim they've been abandoned by those across the channel and across the Atlantic. The British who voted for Brexit and the Americans who voted for Donald Trump, respectively, both explicit rejections of globalism. And they wonder, how could they abandon us in such a way? How could they abandon our liberal European ideals? And this really reveals the hubris of those writing this manifesto. How could we possibly abandon these liberal European ideas? because they've been tried here just as they've been tried in Europe, and they are failing here just as they are failing in Europe. The difference is that we in America and they in, in Britain have the good sense, at least about half of the population there has good sense to say these are failing, it's not working, the experiment has failed, we need to try something new for the sake of the life of our people. But this reveals the haughtiness of the European intellectual ideology. They worship ideas like they worship God. It's not about, does this work? It's about, how do I feel when I talk to my friends about Goethe and Erasmus and Dante? There's only more proof that they failed in their own words when they say, without Europe, freedom, women's rights, democracy, egalitarianism is hard to defend. Because the historical success of Europe made it a lot easier to defend those values abroad. You could go abroad to places that traditionally don't value things like egalitarianism and democracy, and you can say, look how well Europe has done. Look how well they've done as a result of these values. But without Europe there to hold up as the ideal, you can't make that argument anymore. But instead of thinking, why is that? Why are people turning away from these values in Italy, in France with the Yellow Vests, in Britain with Brexit, in America with Donald Trump, in Hungary with Viktor Orban, in Poland, everywhere else in Eastern Europe. Instead of thinking, why are these things happening? Why are people turning away? They just think, 
we have to maintain this so that we can continue to evangelize in the name of European classical liberalism, which is failing. Instead of thinking about how they can change their governments, how they can change their messaging, what direction they need to take things in the future, they think, how can we trick people into holding on to these failed, antiquated ideas? In true intellectual fashion, however, they don't have any solutions. They simply say, we cannot resign ourselves to this catastrophe. We can't resign ourselves to this catastrophe. But they have no solutions because there are no solutions. We've tried this experiment in America. We've tried it in Britain. We've tried it in France. We've tried it in Germany. It's been tried out through the whole of Europe. And it's not working. People are turning away from it in droves for a reason because it has not worked. These governments, these people, these intellectuals have sold the souls of their populations on the altar of this liberal idea. And what we need to understand is that it's not just liberalism in the modern iteration. It's not just open borders, high taxes, etc. It's all forms of liberalism which cause these ills in our society. That's what they're talking about, though. And they talk about pluralism religious toleration, all of these different things which are wrapped up in the European sense of traditional classical liberalism, these are all at the root of the failures of modern liberalism that we see today. The problem in Europe and in America is ideology like this. It's intellectuals with no solutions. It's intellectuals that want to hold on to their ideology like a religion. They look at ideas like they look at God. In fact, their ideas are God. They worship them as gods. And even when they're proved wrong, they will find some dogmatic interpretation in order to prove that they're actually right. In order to move forward, in order to restore prosperity and sovereignty in the Western world, not only do we have to rid ourselves of institutions like the European Union or the United Nations, we also have to rid ourselves of thinking and thinkers like this. My name is Jake Lloyd reporting for NewsWars.com. Crazy stuff, folks. Yellow Vest leader handicapped for life by police. You know, this is an appropriate upbeat song, so I want to get a little bit upbeat here uh, because in next hour, I will be diving into some of this more intense news that you're going to need to hear and, and see. It really is uh, the war against uh, Europe itself. Just absolutely disgusting stuff. So we're going to have a little bit of fun before we do that at the end of this first hour. Uh, BuzzFeed, of course, is shutting down all sorts of uh, its different bureaus and desks and this sort of thing. It, <laughs> and uh, there's so much to say about this. I mean, uh, can you believe that, that the poor folks at BuzzFeed have had to reduce their LGBTQ desk down to one person? Where there used to be an office full of glitter and life and electronic music there's now a single lonely fabulous gay man sitting at a desk surrounded by empty chairs quietly sobbing uh, we 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 feel for you buzzfeed we're so sorry this happened to you of course you have people like oliver darcy coming out and saying it's absolutely vile anybody celebrating the fact that buzzfeed is shutting down when this little possum face bastard actively has tried and has gotten pretty darn close to succeeding of getting my job ruined, the entire crew's jobs eliminated. Has, I mean, it was his job to try to get InfoWars kicked off and all of our jobs lost, not because we write a bunch of uh, trivial BS nonsense, uh, uh, you know, just dribble, but because he doesn't like us ideology. Now, BuzzFeed, it's just insane. I actually have compiled a little list of uh, you know, some of the investments that have been made in these so-called alternative media, these, these leftist media. I'm not having very much fun, am I? I'm just, I'm just going off now because I, I hate BuzzFeed. But that's fine. Uh, you know, hopefully you're having fun. But uh, a thousand people lost jobs this week in the media. BuzzFeed cut 15% of its staff in new rounds of layoff. Uh, Buzz, uh, BuzzFeed layoffs gut the national news desk and the national security team. As I said before, why would you need a national security team when you literally try actively to undermine national security at every chance you get? BuzzFeed lays off but, uh, dozens of journalists 
oh, this is interesting, NBC raises eyebrows with over $400 million relationship with BuzzFeed. Almost half a billion dollars given from NBC to BuzzFeed so BuzzFeed can create a whole bunch of liberal BS nonsense, and then NBC can report on BuzzFeed reporting on it, putting, uh, like, they're almost laundering their fake news. You understand that's what they're doing. They're letting the discredited, you know, uh, uh, BS artists at BuzzFeed come out with stories that then they can report on, and they don't get any of the heat because they've laundered it through this joke of a company. Well, even with $400 million dollars, just injected into their coffers, uh, they still fail. We at InfoWars, we don't have that. We don't have anything like that. We wouldn't even want it. And then, yeah, that was where I was going next. NBC now is having a special where they are promoting underage drag kids, an entire special normalizing pedophilia. NBC is the enemy. They are trying to take down this country in any way that they can, culturally, politically, economically. So they are now having a special on NBC celebrating and promoting underage drag kids. I I cannot believe that this is allowed to take place in America. Of course, you have people like Young Turks, exactly the same thing happening last year, shedding senior employees and staff shakeup. Young Turks slashes staff, drops entertainment programming. This comes one year after they raised $20 million in venture capital, capital funding. So this is what's happening, folks. Billionaires, millionaires, billionaires, giant corporations, and uh, banking combines are injecting money into leftist organizations so they can spout their pro-globalist, anti-Christian, anti-white, pro-social justice, pro-communist uh, uh, propaganda. They're just, just injecting hundreds of millions of dollars into this, and they're still failing because they're just that unpopular. But are they allowed to fail are the people of America, you know, given what they want from the companies that they expect to receive their news from? No, not at all. They, uh, you know, people like InfoWars that are supported 100% by our audience, 100% by people going to InfoWars.com forward slash show, they want to destroy us while they're receiving hundreds of millions of dollars from faceless, shadowy combines and billionaires and millionaires to spout propaganda and of course the the hallmark of this the champions at this game are vice and you just have to go back through their history but even just in june 2017 you have vice scoring a 450 million dollar deal to make the quote largest millennial video library in the world which is great you know oh we just got 450 million dollars just injected into us you know we'll be able to, to create a lot of great videos oh what's this one month later Vice Media lays off about 60 staffers as it refocuses on video. So sorry, I know we just got half a billion dollars. And because of that, we're going to have to let all of you go. They're so heartless. These people are just... Uh, then one year later, you have Vice Canada cutting 23 jobs in another round of layoffs. November 8th, 2018, Vice Media sets hiring freeze and looks to reduce staff by 15%. And then in, uh, one day later, November 9th, 2018, Vice devalued. Disney writes off $157 million of its stake in a struggling media company. So when you hear us talking about a fabricated reality, that this is it. This is the fabricated reality, all right? Giant million-dollar, billion-dollar companies just fully supported and funded by billionaires and millionaires with certain special interests that they want to see pushed totally disregarding the desires of their customers, totally disregarding, you know, the facts, the truth, anything like that. And of course you see it in Disney, you see it with Marvel, you see it with Star Wars. It's very clear what the people want. It's very clear how the people of America feel about what's going on. But their desires to just see entertaining content, to just be inspired and uplifted by going to the movies and seeing a portrayal of magic and space wars and all of this awesome stuff, no, that, that doesn't matter. We're going to spend billions of dollars just jamming social justice down their throat. Just, just totally disregarding what they actually want and just, just jamming our, our ideology down their throat until they're so confused they think it's the only thing that exists in the world. And then we're going to have a, a special promoting drag kids. But 
then you have this thing with the with the Covington uh, kids, total fake news. They ran with it. They they called for these kids to have their heads chopped off. And this comes the like like two days after the media gets egg all over their face for believing freaking BuzzFeed about their story about uh, Donald Trump, the bombshell, uh, the, the the bombshell that came out about Donald Trump. Let's go to this video and just sit back and and relax and and let the waves of failure from the media wash over you as we enjoy uh, these clips from MSN, NBC, and others. Go. A giant news story from BuzzFeed News today. It is one of the most dramatic and potentially devastating developments. A bombshell reporting. A bombshell. This is a bombshell. In this bombshell. 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 Tonight's bombshell report. We got to get back to that bombshell. The biggest bombshell. BuzzFeed's latest bombshell. Bombshell. Damning and damaging stuff. What may be the most damning allegation yet. What may be the most damning report to date. A new report so damning that if if true, a story that if true, 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 important caveat, if true could mean the president obstructed justice. The president's going to lose his job. Is a game changer. The Trump presidency would be over. Could very well put in motion Donald Trump's impeachment. That's fueling new talk of impeachment. Could very well be impeachment. Could lead to his impeachment. Historically, it's a beeline to impeachment. How close are we getting to impeachment? But, yeah, so, so, whoa. But no one else reported anything different. This president committing a federal crime. Let's say that one more time. Lie to Congress. We are at a turning point here. Individual number one is in big, big trouble. BuzzFeed's description of specific statements to the special counsel's office and characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Mr. Cohen's uh, congressional testimony are not accurate. Don't fall for what these politicians out there want you to do. They want you to think we're all crooked. We're not. The record of the press in reporting the Russia story is actually pretty spectacular. They're not saying it's false. They're saying not the, the overall the false. Old, it's not accurate. It's an old term of art for flax. It doesn't mean it's not true. It means that maybe the, in, a, in certain iotas, it wasn't quite true. The story publishes, and then 22 hours later, we get this statement. Yeah. That's a strange, right? That's a weird fact pattern. I think for the audience at home, I think this is even more frustrating than it was last night. It's frustrating a bit that the, that the statement from the special counsel did not specifically say what was uh, inaccurate. I think Robert Mueller's strategy of saying nothing about anything ever, even off the record, is very frustrating. Mueller didn't do the media any favors tonight, and he did do the president one. This is what liberals do. Something happens, there's some pushback, there's some nuance, and liberals go into this like backpedaling. But I just think this is a bad day for us. No, it reinforces every bad stereotype about the news media. You know, they're stereotypes for a reason. You're bad. You're bad at your job. That's why. The left and its Orwellian scourge of erasing American history crept into the Texas state capitol. Dallas Representative Eric Johnson was triggered by a plaque commemorating the children of the Confederacy. So the ironically named State Preservation Board, led by Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Patrick, unanimously voted to take it down with zero feedback from the public. A portion of the 60-year-old plaque reads, We therefore pledge ourselves to preserve pure ideals, to honor our veterans, to study and teach the truths of history. One of the most important of which is that the war between the states was not a rebellion, nor was its underlying cause to sustain slavery. The plaque, which is now in the hands of a curator determined by the State Preservation Board, was merely attempting to bring the complicated economic and political circumstances to those desiring education of Texas history. This is Texas Freedom Force, an organization that has been fighting the statewide attack on Texas monuments, were finally given the floor to counter the leftist madness. Texas history has a lot of you know, good and bad, but the thing is we're here to protect every, everything about it. As, just, as fellow Texans, we know that, you know, we are strong-minded, we're strong-willed, and there's no way nobody's going to take that away from us. Our history means something. And the Texans, and especially Texas, is rich in our history. And there is an assault right now on all of our monuments. And it started in San Antonio with the Travis Park Monument and moved to Dallas to the Lee Park Monument, which we've seen both destroyed, basically, or damaged, I should say. They're removed and damaged, uh, some to the point of ill, Ill uh, repair. And you have Mr. Leach here, who publicly 
stated that he would put a sledgehammer to the black if it, if it was up to him. And I will tell you how deeply offensive that is because that's like him saying that he would take a sledgehammer and go out into the cemetery where my ancestors are buried and knock over the headstones with a sledgehammer, okay? You know, ISIS does this. <laughs> that's right. ISIS goes around, destroys historical religious sites, and I call it cultural terrorism. This board has participated and done cultural terrorism. You remove something that you had no business removing without public input, you know, and so my question is, who in the heck do you think you are? The general population is rarely allowed to vote on the agenda that's being pushed, large or small, in this case, the, the plaque, for instance, and such was the case here. Why did the opinion of the people on this matter not matter? The plaque has been here for decades, bothering no one except a very few, and then boom, all of a sudden it's offensive. It's a blight on the wall. Well, you know what? Of course it was not. You can't control people that have values, and you're certainly not going to control them as long as they're armed. As long as we have the ability to fight and fight you know, liberalism and socialism, whatever it is, uh, they're not going to win. They have to get all of those things done, and they're trying their best to do it. You know, they are trying their best to disarm American citizens. They didn't want any opposition of what they just did, but in reality, what Abbott Folks, you can and watch that full uh, video by Dan John Bowne at Infowars.com, Newswars.com, or on the Resistance News YouTube page. And, folks, there's something very unique about Texas, and you know it if you live here, uh, you know it if you visit here, you know it even if you can conceptualize what Texas is. America is the only country in the world with our level of freedom, bar none. I mean, as much as we're losing it, we have more freedom than the rest of the world. And Texas embodies that spirit more so than anywhere else in America. So this is an enclave that's very special and very unique, and we will fight for it. And then, of course, you have this headline from the Washington Examiner today, Texas Republicans fear Trump could lose the state in 2020. This is why Texas is being targeted. This is why we have Californians moving in at record levels. This is why they're allowing illegals to vote up to 58,000 confirmed of having voted in Texas in just the last week. This has been confirmed. They are doing everything they can to bring down Texas, and Texans need to fight because if we fall, America falls. If America falls, the world falls. This is the fight, and we're in it, folks. Welcome back, folks. Second hour of the David Knight Show. Harrison Smith sitting in for David on this Tuesday, the 29th of January, 2019. This may be my last week hosting as uh, David is returning to strength. He's in fighting form, and he's ready to get back behind the desk and give you all the professorial, uh, uh, calm, rational, and liberty-centered uh, breakdown of the news that you have uh, grown to love and that I have uh, missed these last few weeks. So I have so appreciated uh, being here and being able to sit in for him, and I've so appreciated uh, getting a better connection with Info Warriors uh, from all around the country and all around the world. Of course, I'm on the Infocoms uh, board. Uh, some of y'all have been tweeting at me, Harrison H. Smith, and I have uh, so appreciated the, the increased contact that this position has allowed me to have. And uh, you know, I look forward to getting back to uh, producing really uh, in-depth reports uh, once, I, once I'm back behind, uh, behind my desk there. But uh, this is an insane time <laughs> going on in the world right now. Uh, the European people are under concerted attack. American people are under concerted attack. And the violence and hatred and, and just vile behavior of the left goes unreported, un... Uh, uh, it's just there's no concern about it. There's no... There's no push to stop it. It's seen as a good thing. It's, it's portrayed as heroic and, uh, and, and brave when Antifa goes out and beats random people in the street. Uh, you know, I could show you well, a dozen, two dozen videos of people uh, beaten either for being, uh, for, for having a red hat on or one guy was just white and so they thought he was a Trump supporter and they broke his eye socket. Uh, you know, all sorts of really fun stuff going on that the media not only doesn't condemn, actually celebrates it many times. And this is not just against 
the nameless, unspoken for Trump supporter being beaten bloody in the streets by rabid communists and uh, racists. But it, it extends to our congressmen. It extends to our representatives. It extends to those people that we have bestowed upon them the honor and the privilege and the duty to represent us and our views uh, in Congress. See, they try to destroy those people because they cannot stand the fact that we have a modicum, uh, uh, just a, a humble taste of what it's like to be represented and have, have, have actually representative people in this representative democracy who actually look out for our interests. The, the, the leftists can't handle that. They need 100% control. And once they get that control, they exert it heartlessly. And so Rand Paul, of course, was beaten nearly to death on his front lawn. Not only was this basically forgotten about as soon as it happened, it came on the heels of Steve Scalise uh, being gunned down by a rabid Bernie-supporting socialist madman, as well as Rand Paul, who was on the field, could have been assassinated at that time. I mean, God knows where we'd be without this champion of liberty there in the Senate actually looking out for our interests. But now, today, a jury will decide just how much the man who broke Rand Paul's ribs will have to pay. This uh, story from Kentucky.com puts it pretty well. It says, how much should it cost to tackle a U.S. senator and break half a dozen of his ribs? And, of course, we all remember the clips of people on TV saying, my favorite thing to have happened this year was Rand Paul being beaten and left bloodied and, and crippled on his lawn. That was their favorite thing to have happened this year. Somebody else said, uh, of course Rand Paul can be beaten. Just ask his neighbor. Their Rand Paul's quote says, at this point, I thought, I can't breathe. If I do nothing, this may be the last breath I ever take because whoever is doing this isn't stopping. And I really thought if I get another blow to my back, I wasn't going to survive. And so really, I did think I could die at that point. The thought crossed my mind, I may never get up from this lawn again. That is a U.S. senator. Absolutely insane. What is going on? Could you possibly imagine what would happen what the outrage would be what the i mean they would rush to the senate floor and demand a martial law immediately if nancy pelosi were to be beaten nearly to death in her front lawn and left with ribs cracked struggling to breathe as her assailant uh, you know wasn't stopped by anybody nobody's coming to stop them and he's stomping on Nan nancy pelosi until she's nearly dead could you possibly imagine what the response would be? Well, the response here is this guy is going to get a little fine. It's going to get a little fine up to $500,000 in damages to compensate for pain and suffering and up to $1 million to punish this guy. Let's take a look really quick at this video from the courtroom and Rand Paul describing the pain he was in at his trial. What I learned is that I had um, six ribs broken. Um, that three of them that were, were separated, basically displaced. A lot of people, in fact, quite almost all people have a crack from a hairline fracture. I had three that were completely displaced. So he's saying that. six ribs so broken, three, three bone, dislocated bone. from the bone. It's the pain of a thousand knives, I mean. Pain of a thousand knives. Sneeze and hip up with Jake and my knees. I mean, this is, this is a pain. Most people would tell you if they had one sort of cracked rib, how much it hurts. I had three cracked ribs and three displaced ribs that were grinding upon each other with every breath Jesus and every motion. And uh, I didn't take the decision lightly, but I thought that um, I wanted to see if I could avoid the narcotics because of the risk of addiction. Wow. Describing the pain of having your dislocated ribs rubbing together. And the pain of a sneeze bringing you to your knees. That man is a hero. He is a champion. He is an integral part of our resistance against the totalitarianism that is threatening to destroy our liberty. God bless that man. And every curse in the book to this guy, Butcher, Butcher, whatever, whatever his name is. <sighs> Absolutely absurd. And, and, I mean, 
I, I don't know. I, I don't know. What to, I, I don't know what to say about this. I mean, they literally beat our senators half to death. They shoot them down at a baseball game. They completely destroy or attempt to destroy the lives of children because they go to a pro-life march and wear red hats. Uh, our own Caitlin Bennett, I don't, I don't have time to go to the, to the clip now, but Caitlin Bennett on InfoWars.com has a uh, video called University of Cincinnati Students Call for Violence Against Conservatives as they chant, hit her, as a bus drives by, and one student admitting that his peers urged him to kill her. And this just, you know, we just deal with this. We just say, hey, you know, that's, that's the price I guess we have to pay for daring to request a little bit of representation in this representative uh, government that our ancestors fought for. Uh, man, it's, it's, it's totally sick, and it is, uh, it's happening on an individual le level literally every single day. People are being abused. They're trying to destroy them. And, uh, you know, there you see it. People saying, beat this person up. This is a young, small, blonde girl being physically threatened by men. They don't care. They do not care. These people are evil. And I got to say, I, I did a interview yesterday with uh, Brad Chadford, who was a great guy. And I really, in, in, you know, uh, I've gotten to know him uh, pretty well recently. And, uh, and he's just, he's, he's a great guy. He's a liberal. And I just want to ask these liberals that are decent people, that are intelligent people, that understand what's going on, what are you doing? Why are you on this side? How, how does this fit with your principles if you are, are on the side that beats senators nearly to death, harasses and tries to destroy the lives of children, and gets no pushback? And sure, you can say, well, I don't approve of that. That's not enough. We have to stand up to these people because they want us dead. This is what you have to understand. They want you dead. They want your family dead. And they want your bank account emptied. Hat and the way it makes people feel because it incites fear in all those around us. Every person is afraid of that hat. I'm afraid of that hat. Keep America great. For so many people, that's racism. Yeah, but that's because of the mainstream media's narrative that's painted Donald Trump as a racist. I don't agree. With the, I don't agree with the narrative. I'm out here to try to share that my that that narrative is skewed. As a human being, you should pay attention to fear and not logic. Wait, wait. You said pay attention to fear and not logic? Yes. I should pay attention to emotions and not facts. Yes. Why would I pay attention to emotions when facts are real in this world? Facts, facts, facts are facts. Are fact. No, emotions are real. Emotions no, is think, one removed from spirit. I find that it is hard to trust others. You shouldn't trust the mainstream media. You should like start listening and looking at it. You suggest that is saying don't trust knowledge operate in darkness no go look up facts go look up like actual statistics and facts look up Pew research emotion is real but emotions change don't they? <laughs> that's it folks emotions are facts you heard it here first whoo if you're watching uh, if you're listening on the radio rather uh, that was a bald woman with a tattoo on the side of her head, claiming that we should focus on, quote, fear, not logic. Fear and not logic. This is the underlying insanity. This is the underlying mental sickness that has been injected into the American political scene, the American culture. This did not exist a very short time ago. But this is now just the, the, the baseline liberal attitude is trust fear over facts. They, I mean, do you know the lack of comprehension and, and critical thinking skills that are required to believe such a statement? How are you, I mean, this person's literally saying, you cannot reason with me. I am a cult member. You cannot Use logic and facts. I am blind. I am a fool. I am an idiot. I literally have a mohawk. Jesus. She says, everyone, everyone is scared by the red hat. 
Everyone is terrified by the red hat. And she has the, I mean, just the way, God dang. I mean, no, nothing drives me crazier than this concern trolling kind of, but, but everybody is scared of the hat. And don't you just, don't you, don't you feel for these people that you're scaring right now? My God. Whoo. I want to do violence to that voice. Not the person. Not the person. Just the spirit that embodies them. This spirit that they all share. That they all have. That they all, they all pick up this whiny, feely kind of uh, attitude as they talk. And I, it's just, what is that? It's been injected. It's, it's, it's systematic weakness. It's systematic degrading of their very humanity. They literally don't even want to look like humans anymore. They tattoo themselves. They, they disfigure themselves with piercings. It's, you know, do whatever you want. It's your body. I couldn't care less. But the fact that this is like a, this is like a spirit that has been embodied and engendered within the American culture by the media, by popular uh, influences, it's totally insane. And where it leads to is this report I talked about last segment, and I'll show you this segment, University of Cincinnati students call for violence against conservatives. Let's go to that. Like the one right, right over there. What do you say? Cassie the camera is on me. Cassie. We're saying beat her up. You can't see the subtitles. We're here at the University of Cincinnati asking you to make things from InfoWars reporter Caitlin Bennett visited the University of Cincinnati. A large crowd gathered to follow Bennett as she interviewed students. That is a huge crowd, I have to say. Must be 50 people. Campus police stood by to keep watch on the crowd. That was a lot of people. There's probably 50 people standing around here. Students immediately tweeted threats at Bennett. So the threat says, UC student can, uh, I didn't quite read that, but they're identifying who she was. They're, they're hitting the camera. Some students got testy and weren't ashamed to make their threats in person. They're saying beat her up. What do you say? Cassie, the camera's on me. Cassie. This guy was saying that, uh, he wants to be beat up. You want to, you changed your mind? You want to no, thank you. He, wants the he said he wants you to be beat up. This little soy boy, you know she has a gun on her right now, right? I her now. No, I, I got it on camera, so. No. These are just jittering, laughing, brainless uh, chimps. They're, they've, they've been chimpified. A group of conservatives wrote MAGA on a window. <laughs> and students called for them to be beaten up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Different thoughts. Different thoughts, they need to be physically beaten. Someone beat these people up. I'm gonna get paid from all this hate that's being thrown at me because we're gonna make separate videos about it. She's like, I'm gonna get paid from all this. She's so cool. A student told Bennett that his peers urged him to kill her. On social media, and I had like five people swipe up saying, like, shoot her, kill her. Not like they would, but still. Shoot her, kill her. She likes guns. Kill her. Like, I don't agree with the MAGA hat kid. Insanity. No matter who instigated the event, I don't think anyone should get a death threat. No matter how much I hated a person, I would never advocate for violence to be thrown at them. What do you mean? Like, if it was in the context, depending on the context... Then they're shouting, hit her, as the, the bus drives by. I mean, they literally think this is funny. They literally are gibbering like demons, like, like monkeys. And stunning and brave. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love, love that yeah, you're She's holding a sign that says, stop giving bigots attention. Good vibes because I think you're full of shit. Very tolerant. Look at this feminism. That's all they have. It's just like, we think you're full of it. We Thank think you're a bigot. What has Kaylin Bennett it. ever done or said to make people think she's a bigot? It says some students refuse to disavow the death threats being sent to Covington Catholic high schoolers. So, you know, you, you can pull it down. Are you These to people disavow? are insane. It starts with words, it leads very quickly to action. This is laying the groundwork for the justification for violence against conservative people. I mean, it, it already happens, it already is being justified, but you see it there with this mass of just dead eyed, gibbering, smiling fools 
just drooling and just and just I mean it's like it's like a, a generation of Beavis and Buttheads all just just you know giggling at the fact that somebody they disagree with is being threatened with death and violence in a world in a country where that violence is acted out on an almost daily basis and is unreported uncovered unknown outside of those who perpetrate it folks the attack is on this is it <laughs> it's like i keep saying it it's like this is it this is the crossroads this is the culmination of all of this massive communistic anti-american brainwashing the dumbing down through the chemicals through the television through the screens it's it's all culminated in this this mass this population of gibbering laughing zombie monkeys that don't understand that they're being enslaved they're laughing with with chains around their necks oh sorry i uh, i didn't see you there i was just pouring this packet of turbo force into my eight ounces of cold water because I need a boost as we are now about halfway through the David Knight show. You know, you can get this on InfoWarsStore.com. You can get it on InfoWarsLife.com. And uh, I'll tell you what, you get the bang for your buck. This is the real deal. This is uh, what energy drinks purport to be. This is what energy drinks wish they could be. Why? Well, A, it's delicious. B, it uh, really gives you long-lasting energy. I mean, a lot of people use it as a pre-workout, but I don't work out, so I just drink it and love it. Uh, but it's got, I mean, it's got this uh, herbal energy blend, uh, green tea leaf extract, cola nut extract, coffee berry, coffee fruit extract. Uh, it goes on and on. I don't even know how to pronounce this one. Gai Gaiosa? Leaf extract, guarana seed extract, and yerba mate leaf extract. These are all natural, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, supplements taken from, from tea leaves, as well as vitamin C, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, taurine. I ripped it in half, so I can't really read it. Taurine, beta uh, alanine. I mean, th this is the good stuff. And what it doesn't have is uh, 14 tablespoons of sugar. Like one particularly popular energy drink has 14 tablespoons, which almost fills up this entire glass with sugar. Okay, uh, it doesn't have it doesn't rely on nothing but caffeine, so it doesn't give you that crash uh, that coffee gives you. This is the real deal. This is the good stuff, and this is it's like we we really want to make it easy for you to support us. It already is easy to support us. You can go to infowarsstore.com and and buy whatever you want, and that helps support this mission to reestablish free speech and reclaim the America that we know and love for its people and stop it being taken over by global interests. So it helps us with that, but we make it even easier by making the products actually amazingly good stuff. Amazingly good stuff. Turbo Force, uh, the tropical berry flavor is what's out now. Energy metabolism and alertness. This is, this is the premier product. This is I mean, I, I'm predicting, you know, now that Super Male Vitality, which is still 50% off, still an amazing product, a groundbreaking product, Super Male Vitality, it's leaving, it's going away. The herbs that we use were too rare, too good, too valuable. We are not able to, to uh, cold press them at as high of a level as we would like to going forward. So Super Male Vitality is ending. How appropriate it is that our next flagship product comes in through the door at that time. Turbo Force is the real deal. Here's what I suggest you do. Buy a pack, okay? Buy two packs. Keep one at your house. Should last you, I think, something about two weeks. Take the other, ha take the other box and just put it in your, in your office. Put it in the, you know, you usually have a kitchen there or something. Just put it there. Just leave it on the counter. Maybe put a little, a little sticky note saying, you know, anybody can have this or whatever. And watch as the people in your office use it, drink it, love it, and then are horrified to find out that it comes from big, bad Alex Jones, that the product that they love, that gives them energy and they find themselves wanting to buy for themselves, and they say, hey, where'd you get this? I love this stuff. You know, it's, it's, I, I've totally cut out my uh, coffee. I used to drink three cups of coffee a day. I, I cut down on that. Hey, I've cut down on my energy drinks. I used to spend $5 a can with a, for a can this big. I, I'm saving money. 
uh, you know, where do you get this stuff? And you tell them, oh, you just go to InfoWarsStore.com and watch their face as they realize, as it rushes over them, that everything they've been told about Alex Jones is a lie. <laughs> when people say he's a snake oil salesman, that his products don't work, watch their realization as they realize how much they love this product. And then they realize that it's from InfoWarsStore.com. It, you know, it's fun. It's a way to make giving gifts fun, <laughs> in my opinion. And uh, like I said, delicious and uh, gives you energy. And I needed to get through this uh, second half of the David Knight Show. In the third hour, I will be joined by Millie Weaver. My God, it really is good. I'm not even kidding. I've said this before, but I bought packets similar to this uh, because I liked this so much and it wasn't out yet. I, I went out and got other, other packets. I won't say the brand name, but it literally tastes like chemicals. This stuff just tastes straight up like delicious fruit punch, and it's amazing. Now, really quickly, in this segment, I want to talk about uh, the 2020 race and just how stupid it already is. And I'll give you a breakdown about this Howard Schultz guy and about why he's doing what he's doing. Maybe I'll do that in the next segment. Hmm. Maybe I'll wait. Maybe, maybe I'll tease that because that's going to take a second. Because, you, you know, in order to understand what's happening with Howard Schultz, you really have to have a uh, pretty intimate knowledge of what is going on within the Democratic Party right now. And not only is it not being reported on by... Uh, you know, people on the right wing very much because we don't tend to take the leftist tactics of like infiltrating and leaking information out and, uh, you know, watching what they're doing all the time. Uh, but I do. I know what they're up to. I watch uh, their, their broadcasts. I pay attention to what they're saying. So I know what the tactics are that they're using. I know uh, the, the ongoing subversion and overtaking of the Democratic Party that's being enacted now by the Democratic Socialists of America and similar groups. Oh, I've got your number. You, th you thought I didn't know? <laughs> you thought that this was just gonna, gonna happen and no one was gonna notice? And of course, it's definitely not being reported on by the media because the media is in bed with the corporate Democrats and the corporate Democrats are the ones who are being beaten by the Democratic Socialist. Democrats. And this is an ongoing insurgency that they have planned out. They're very well orchestrated, very well networked, and surprise, surprise, they're funded out of the pockets of billionaires and big business. Because what the socialists don't understand is anything. But what they really don't understand is that they are puppets for the moneyed elite, for the international bankers, for the people that they think they're fighting. Those people are laughing their heads off. <laughs> I mean, it's so fun. You know, I, I talked about it a little bit last week, too. When you have Davos in Switzerland. Now, when I say Switzerland, what comes to your mind? Chocolates, skiing, yodeling, perhaps? Oh, what jumps to my mind is international banking, is secret bank accounts, is offshore Money holding. It's where the rich go, along with the Bahamas, along with various island nations that were given independence by Britain for this express reason in the 70s, so that the rich people in these countries could hide their vast riches offshore or in a place like Switzerland. So Switzerland is like the epitome, the, the, the home base of the international bankers. It is the place synonymous with hiding your money. So the Davos happens. They go, all these billionaires go and meet there, and they, they come out with a statement saying, oh, no, please don't. Please don't charge us more, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It would ruin us if you charged us more taxes, knowing full well the vast majority of their fortune, I mean 95% of their fortune, is untouchable by the government of the United States and will not be affected by these million, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, taxes that people like Elizabeth Warren and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are floating, 70% tax above uh, $10 million, something of this, of this uh, type. These people would love for this to happen because what happens 
when you put in something that says, hey, over 10 million, we take 70% of your money, over 10 million. What happens is the people who are already in these networks, the people who these networks have already chosen, they get the secrets. They get told, here's where you hide your money. They get told, here's the right lawyer who will know how to avoid these taxes. They get gifted the gift of the elite who tell them how to screw over the people. But if you're not in that club, then the government comes in and destroys you on their behalf. Is it becoming clear yet, you puppets? All right, folks, let me give you the breakdown of what is happening within the Democratic Party right now that you may not be aware of. Uh, basically, there are organizations such as the Justice Democrats and the Democratic Socialists of America who have come out and actively said, I mean, they basically have uh, just come out and declared war against uh, uh, corporate Democrats, as they call them, the establishment Democrats. Uh, and they have uh, declared war against them. And this is, of course, uh, in response in large part to the way that the Democrats treated Bernie Sanders in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and obviously just totally screwing him over. Funny, funny little little story. I'm not sure if I've told yet. Uh, one time I was in Mexico. Uh, I was actually working as a cameraman for Ben Swan. And we were uh, reporting on corruption and uh, protest there in Mexico. And I was talking to a fellow cameraman who was a uh, progressive socialist guy. And this was before the 2016 election, a couple years before, I think. And it was uh, after the Ron Paul uh, debacle, where essentially they did uh, similar things to Ron Paul as they did to Bernie Sanders, uh, except they did it just right out in the open. They basically said, hey, you have to have this many uh, uh, representatives, or this, you, know, you have to have this many votes to be considered here and so he he got those votes and then made his whole game plan to go to the convention and win there and then when the convention started they just changed the rules and said no you used to have to have five states now you have now you have to have eight and so they changed that rule last minute so he never had a chance to even try to get eight they just changed the rules to screw him out of it so this was a topic of discussion because Ben Swan uh, really came to prominence by reporting on this and revealing this fact uh, on his segment Reality Check. So I was talking about this with my fellow cameraman, socialist progressive, and he basically was totally didn't care. He was just like, I was like, no, but isn't this wrong that we have a political party that can, can dictate who we're allowed to have our representative? Isn't this a bad thing? Don't you care about this? And his response was, no, who cares? They're a private institution. And if you have a problem with that, then you have to take it up with a private institution. But doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They can do whatever they want. I often wonder. I mean, I, I can, I guarantee you, I actually am pretty positive because I'm friends with the guy on Facebook. Like he was a Bernie supporter in 2016. And when exactly the same thing happened to Bernie as happened to Ron Paul, or at least something very similar, I wonder if he thought back to that conversation where I was trying to warn him that this is what they do and that they'll destroy him. I wonder if he cares now about what it is because this is just how consistent I feel like I am is. I am repulsed by everything that Bernie Sanders represents. Socialism, communism, just repulsed. And yet, I would fight for him to get that nomination because he deserved it, because that is the rule, because I don't like corruption, because I don't like rich donors and, and an elite class of superdelegates dictating what the American people want. So as, as repulsed as I am of Bernie Sanders, I would never do the thing that this anti-Ron Paul guy did and say, oh, so what? Screw you. It's your fault. No, it was wrong with Ron Paul. It was wrong with Bernie Sanders. It's wrong because they have a stranglehold on the entire democratic process, which is destroying our entire republic and only could be overcome with someone like Donald J. Trump which is why he is such a special person. <laughs> but the point is that after 2016, and when the socialists saw how uh, the Democrats destroyed Bernie Sanders, they put plans into motion. Now, I remind you, they are incredibly organized and well-networked uh, because they are supported by shadow money and uh, dark money. And you know, I'm sure they just think that, oh, America loves us, and they're giving us money. They don't even care that it's 
it's literally the most evil people in the world and the richest people in the world that are paying for them to do their bidding. But here's the point. Bernie Sanders cannot run as a Democrat. They changed the rules. He was always an independent, yet he ran on the Democratic ticket in 2016. They said, we can't have that happen again. So now if you're not registered as a Democrat for like the year or whatever before, then you can't run as a Democrat. So Bernie Sanders will not be running as a Democrat this year or in 2020. However, I don't think he's out yet. I think he still has a huge base of support. I think he still has sycophantic, uh, uh, you know, hallucinating children who think that he can win. And so they're trying to lay the groundwork for this. These are the people that got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez elected. These are the people that got uh, Beto O'Rourke so closely to be uh, so close to being elected in Texas. And I'm going to uh, I've already written the script. I'm, I'm working on a very in-depth report explaining exactly how this happens under the title of something like Democrats Go Local, because they have decided that not just national uh, races are, are important, but they actually need to just funnel millions of dollars from New York and California into local races to capture local offices to then turn those offices into social activist platforms. Now, this is happening, and I reported on it extensively with Lena Hidalgo, the 26-year-old judge, or 20, she's maybe 28-year-old judge that was elected in Houston to oversee all of Harris County, uh, and basically has come out saying, you know, oh, I know I'm supposed to be taking care of the roads and ca caring for floods, but actually my number one priority is making sure to educate elementary school children about how beneficial socialism is. That's literally her agenda. That's how she's going to use the power that has been given to her. And of course, the only reason she was elected into office was because 85% of the votes she got were straight ticket Democrats, meaning that these socialists, these, these uh, activists, these social justice warriors hyper identify uh, uh, demographic blocks and just, just pour money into getting out the vote there. So how does this all come back? It all comes back to Howard Schultz, who is not really running for president, ladies and gentlemen. This is the revelation. This man is the swamp personified. This man is globalism and crony capitalism and uh, corrupt government personified. And he's running because what they're trying to do is establish a pattern, establish a fact that an independent candidate can pose a threat to the Democrats and the Republicans because the social uh, Democrats have realized that they cannot overtake the Democrats. They cannot beat them at their own game. So this is the next step. They're trying to establish a pattern of recognition for people to believe that an independent uh, uh, politician can run for president and win. It's not a Democrat and not a Republican. This guy is running as an independent, which frankly doesn't make any sense because he is a lifelong blue blood, died in the wool Democrat. So he should be running as a Democrat. Why isn't he? Why isn't he taking advantage of all of the networks that are already established and all of the fundraising and all of the you know primary uh, uh, machinations that can be used? It's because He's not actually running for president. He's trying to establish the fact that an independent can run. The problem is it's running into a wall because the people that aren't privy to these machinations are confused and they're shouting him down. He got 30 seconds into his you know, inaugural speech inaugurating his, his presidential candidacy before he shouted down by a heckler. Let's watch that video now. I am seriously considering running for president as a centrist independent. And I wanted to clarify the word independent, which I view uh, merely as a designation on the ballot. And Trump, what help elect Trump, you egotistical billionaire <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. So uh, these Democrats are mad because they think that they recognize, in fact, that the socialist Democrats are actively working towards splitting the Democratic Party. That is their goal. That is their stated goal that they're trying to achieve. 
And they're trying to do it. First, they tried to do it by infiltrating the Democratic Party. Now, what this tells me that they're running this Howard Schultz guy is that they are uh, trying to run as independent since they can't beat the Democratic machine that is owned by Hillary Clinton ever since it was bankrupted by Barack Obama and then subsidized and uh, after that taken over by Hillary Clinton. Guys, can you pull up uh, the Democratic Socialist of America's logo? I want to point this out. Now, the reason why this is so laughable to me is because this guy, Howard Schultz, well, he's now hiring ex-Obama aide uh, as communications advisor. So he's bringing in uh, an Obama aide to run his, uh, his communication. But in addition, he's already included a number of public relations executives, including Steve Schmidt, who used to be a vice chairman at Edelman and managed Republican Senator John McCain's presidential campaign in 2008. Y'all find that logo? So this man's a swamp. This man's a swamp monster. McCain, Obama combined. Good the news, he's not actually running for president. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Third hour begins. Millie Weaver joins me shortly to co-host this final hour. I'm just going to stick for this uh, next five minutes on uh, Howard Schultz that I was talking about yesterday, heckled within the first few seconds of his first campaign appearance in New York City. And you have, uh, you know, people like Representative Julian Castro saying, I would suggest Mr. Schultz truly think about the negative impact that siphoning votes from the Democrats might take. And basically the same idea that was uh, expressed by that uh, heckler who says you're going to help get Trump elected. See, they are not in favor of the Democrat socialist agenda. The socialists have infiltrated their party and are now thinking that they'll be able to pull the wool over America's eyes and run people as independents and siphon votes away from Trump while uh, getting around the tyrannical uh, network, the, the tyrannical, how would I say it, uh, infrastructure of the Democratic Party. And so once again, you have Howard Schultz announcing he's running for president. There's a little background on him. After his tenure as an advisor, in President Barack Obama's administration. Oh, no, this is, uh, this is Burton. Okay, so this is the person that uh, Schultz is actually trying to hire. So Schultz is hiring former Obama aide Bill, Bur uh, Bill Burton as communication advisor. This is, uh, Burton was, a t was an advisor for Barack Obama, and he founded Priorities USA Action, a super PAC that originally was dedicated to helping Obama get reelected. And since then, the PAC has become a powerhouse and recently helped Democrats make inroads into the U.S. House of Representatives. So why would this diehard Democrat suddenly go independent? It's because they are trying to set up somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders or another socialist puppet to run against President Trump in 2020 and uh, you know, doing what they hope will destroy the Democratic Party that they see is corrupt and bought out. Now, how they're able to understand that the Democrats are corporate and corrupt and like that, that heckler in the video shouted, go back to Davos with the other billionaires. So again, I'm just, I'm just baffled by socialists that seem to understand things up to like the kiddie pool level, but they never do the deep dive and actually think about what it means that the Democrats are so controlled what it means that the Republicans are so controlled, what it means that Donald Trump is hated by both of those people, what it means that Donald Trump is uh, hurting these people that they claim to hate, and yet they hate Donald Trump even more. They don't understand what's going on. They do understand how to manipulate people, and so they are infiltrating and trying to undermine the Democratic Party. And this is just, you know, this is what you learn when you watch some of their videos. If you go to, you know, Young Turks and these things, they're, they think they're sneaky, they think they're being political operatives, it, you, you guys are literal puppets of the, the billionaires. You, you understand that, right? They have it, it, the people in Davos who are like, no, please don't. We don't want this. Like, they also are saying that while their hand is in your backside, puppeting you, telling you what to do. You fools. You massive, massive fools. Trump, of course, says that Howard Schultz doesn't have the guts to run. Uh, and it's true, he doesn't, but he's not actually running. He is trying to establish the fact that an independent could be a viable candidate in the next election. Just telling you this, this guy will be dropping out of the race very shortly.
He does not want to run. He is not actually trying to get elected president. He has no chance, but he will drop out. And shortly after that, Democrats will start to announce that they're running as independents, or maybe Bernie Sanders will announce that he's running as an independent against the Democratic Party. Good news is this probably will fracture the Democrats. Uh, the bad news is these people are socialists, and they're actually getting political representation now. And they're actually trying to enact the same uh, policies that have killed 100 million people in the last century and have now driven Venezuela into insane, deadly civil war. So that's what we have to look forward to. A bloodbath. Thanks, socialists. Fools. Millie Weaver on the other side. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, info warriors all. This is Tuesday, the 29th of January, 2019. We enter the third hour of the David Knight Show. Harrison Smith sitting in once again for David Knight. And I have with me on the line, Millie Weaver. Uh, Millie, what is on your mind today? What are you seeing as the big story in the news? Well, I think what we should be focusing on is the upcoming 2020 election. Now, I know that we still have some time until the 2020 campaigning season actually typically happens. However, we're going to see a bunch of Democrat contenders coming out, all biting at the heels of each other, trying to figure out who's going to get to run on this 2020 ticket, because they are expecting to be able to steal the selection or use social media influence to be able to generate enough uh, public opinion that it sways their way. So we have all these Democrat hopefuls right now. And one of the ones that really stands out is Camilla Harris. We know that Camilla Harris has announced her bid for the 2020 election. I think that she would be a perfect candidate that a bunch of these Democrat progressive crazy people will get behind for several reasons. Um, one of which is she's a woman. Another of which is she's biracial. She has African-American descent. Oh, and, say no more. Uh, say no more. She's it. She's the perfect I mean, candidate. I mean, you don't need exactly. ideas, right? It's, it's her identity that's the important part. Well, you know, one of the interesting things here is that actually um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez just came out and said that the 2020 Democrats should focus on and embrace identity politics and tap into women's rage and that it's very potent and very useful in campaigning. So they know the strategy here is to tap into the rage, the emotional hysteria that a lot of these <laughs> feminist women get themselves wrapped up into. How sexist and to is utilize that? that? How it's, sexist it is, is that? It's pretty sexist. Yeah. <laughs> imagine imagine the opposite argument that's like, no, we can't we can't elect these women. They they got too much rage, too much emotion. <laughs> it's like these people, man, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my grip on what is wrong with these people. And have you heard of, I mean, it, I, I don't know, Millie, if you know about Kamala Harris's history, but you know she, her entire political uh, career got started because she dated a 60-year-old married man who has now just come out and said, here's the headline, sure, I dated Kamala Harris. So what? So you gave her a lucrative job in exchange. You openly corrupt jerk <laughs> it's like, you, i mean do you know about this well yes i do know about this and apparently it's not just about pay for play with politics it's about lay for play oh, uh, and it good. looks like camilla harris knows the game you know and what kind of uh woman is that to be an idol or someone to look up to for young girls as the first female president if you got there by essentially getting on your knees and you know, yep. selling yourself out and not respecting yourself, that's not that's now, not good. That's not gonna be a good wait. moral role model for young girls. Now now hold on, Millie. She was she was an attractive young law school graduate. Are you suggesting that she was not legitimately attracted to a sixty year old man who's married? Are you saying that this was a relationship built on something other than intense, passionate physical attraction to this fat sixty year old man? How dare well, you? look, we need to look more into who Willie Brown is to really get the full picture here. Willie Brown has been in the political arena for quite some time. He has political pull and power in the um, black circles of politics in America. And 
He actually started his career in the 50s and 60s as a lawyer, a defense lawyer, and he became famous and well-known because he started defending people that other lawyers typically wouldn't represent, literally, such as pimps, prostitutes, and other prominent uh, clients that were in organized crime. So this man represented pimps. If you look at how this man dresses, he's constantly wearing pimp attire with his little fancy suits and his hats and everything else. And so it's no wonder that then he's essentially helping out Kamala Harris's career in exchange for dating or favors, which, I mean, what does that make Kamala Harris? She's getting yeah. paid for giving out favors essentially to a married man. And this is the culture that we're living in. And the only reason Willie Brown came out against Kamala Harris, he even says it in his own statement here. He says, the difference is that with Harris, she was the only one who, after I helped her, sent word that I would be indicted if I so much as jaywalked while she was the district attorney. Oh, so yeah. This honest man. I believe around. everything this man says. I, I think you might have it wrong, though. I think in this situation, Kamala Harris is the John, and he's actually pimping out California. I think, <laughs> I think that's actually how this – I think he's actually pimping out the, off, the elected offices – of California. And just to, to quote this statement that you just quoted, he says, yes, we dated. It was more than 20 years ago. Yes, I may have influenced her career by appointing her to two state commissions when I was assembly speaker. And I certainly helped her with her first race for district attorney in San Francisco. So he's openly corrupt. He's exchanging sex for favor. He's, he's uh, pimping out the offices that the Californian people trusted him with. But he's like, it's cool. What are you worried but about? He, Shut up. But it's he fine. Also says, he also says that he also influenced and helped the careers of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, Senator Dianne Feinstein, and a host of other politicians. And I've heard him in interviews talking about how he helped Obama in his presidential bid the first time around. So this man has influence and power, and he's able to help these politicians and the only difference, he says, is that Kamala turned around and wasn't loyal to him and told him that he, you know, if he so much as jaywalked, she would come after him. So that means he's not allowed to engage in organized crime. That means he's not allowed to, you know, hold uh, blackmail over her and expect favors from her. So that's the, really the only reason I think that Willie Brown even came out and, and said this about Kamala Harris is how dare you have the goal to try to run for president after you didn't do the game right. And this this just goes to show, he named off this list of Democrat politicians who pretty much sell themselves out, most likely sell their bodies out so that they can have power. Uh, so it's no wonder they're so willing to sell our country out. Is it any wonder? I, I mean, they've done so many studies about people who run for office and political positions of power. Most people who run for political office and try to get those seats of power are people who are narcissists or psychopaths. And so we're dealing with a level of people here who are willing to do anything for power, anything to just get the power and control in their hands so that they can get pay for play. I mean, so many people were commenting on Nancy Pelosi's house. You know, Laura mm -hmm. Loomer went over there and hopped the fence. And people were like, how in the world can Nancy Pelosi afford this mega million mansion in California on her her base pay, which is around like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, she she's I mean, been nothing. She's been nothing but a public servant, and she's worth twenty million dollars plus. Yes, these people are pimping out the country. They're pimping out the the offices that you give them, and it's. I mean, I think you're right that it was just so it's so blatant and obvious the corruption that led to Kamala Harris's entire career that they had to come out in front of it and say you know, and act like it's not a big deal because if it were to be revealed by somebody else, it would, you know, they could make a big deal out of it. So they said, you know what, we're just going to come out and just say, yeah, yeah, we dated, so what? And, and then he, he tries to cover it by saying, but I helped all these other people. Yeah, but did those other people date you? Because that's, that's the issue here. It's not that you helped fellow Democrats. Like, that's what they're trying to portray it as like, oh, what, they're mad that I helped fellow Democrats? It's like, no, <laughs> we're mad that you gave political appointments because she got on her knees, you 
you know, yeah, we're Him. mad that so many politicians are willing to do this pay for play. And it just goes to show they know the game. They're all used to the system. And then once they get in power, they want people to give to them and to have to, you know, give them money or, or favors in exchange for their power. That's all it's about. I mean, if you look at the top contributors that Camilla Harris has, one of her top three is Alphabet Inc., which is Google. So, gee, I wonder who she's going to be doing favors for, Harrison. Gee, I wonder. Look at those. Look at those crones. I mean, that was 20 years ago, and they still look like harpies. Absolutely insane. Millie Weaver. More on the other side. We're going to continue to break down this 2020 race, as as silly as it all is. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you've noticed, but at the beginning of this hour, I mixed in uh, this Turbo Force uh, from Infowars Life into my drink. I literally am already in a better mood, and I feel more energetic. You you probably notice it. I it's it's you you can't hide it with this stuff. It really is incredible. Uh, it's an incredible product. You can find InfoWarsLife.com for thirty three percent off. It has my personal guarantee. Doctor Harrison says that this is what you need to replace your energy drinks and and coffee, uh, and get you not just through the day, but to that next level of energy, that next level of passion and awareness and alertness and and. All that good stuff. I'm literally feeling it right now. Uh, so I, I cannot uh, encourage you enough to go to InfoWarsLife.com, InfoWarsStore.com, and, and get this product. Now, Millie, <laughs> Millie Weaver's on with me, and we're talking about the 2020 race. We just talked about the newest contender uh, on the Democratic side, Kamala Harris, and how she got her start by uh, so called dating the married man, uh, uh, whatever his name is. Willie Brown. Just, Willie Brown. <laughs> Thanks, Willie. Willie Brown. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so she. So, so Millie, she gets her start, you know, on her knees begging this guy for a job. And that's what we mean, begging. And uh, now, would you mind if we moved on to uh, Elizabeth Warren, who got her career started on an utter lie as well, who got her career started by pretending to be a minority and taking the spot that's been allocated in the Harvard staff to uh, miss or un unrepresented, underrepresented. Uh, Native American uh, ethnicities. So, well, Harrison, one of the interesting things about Elizabeth Warren, and I'm glad you brought that up, is that remember that horrible, cringy video on social media where Elizabeth Warren tried to like drink beer on camera <laughs> and act like she's so she's, relatable. Remember, she's so relatable, trying to establish rapport with the youth. Well, I think it's funny because Kamala Harris also did something similar, and she released this mixtape which she said this playlist represented you know black culture in america and if you listen to the music that's all on her mixtape which she's promoting i mean several of these songs have the most derogatory offensive language for women it's insane uh one of the songs by kendrick lamar called humble i mean he's literally saying repeatedly in the song B words, sit down, B words, sit down, and saying like the most <laughs> insane stuff towards women that most of these feminists would say is misogynist, offensive. But somehow when these rappers say it, it's okay. And it, and it reminds me of what Hillary Clinton did in her 2016 presidential campaign bid when she had Jay-Z and a bunch of these rappers hold a concert for her. And these rappers were literally calling women, you know, B words, you know, hoes, saying, you know, talking about cooking up drugs and literally saying the most horrific, offensive stuff towards women. And all the women and people in the audience were just cheering and yay. And then Hillary <laughs> right. Clinton comes out and, and they're like, yeah, we endorse Hillary Clinton. And not, mind you, most of these rappers have histories of being arrested for drugs trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence against their girlfriends. But hey, they're endorsing Hillary Clinton, and Hillary is so glad to be getting their endorsement. And it's the same thing with Kamala Harris when she puts out this playlist, essentially endorsing all of these these rappers that just say the most horrific lyrics about drugs and women. And oh, then yeah. it, it reminded me of Elizabeth Warren when she tried to drink that booze to try to oh be like, God. look at me, I'm so relatable. There's you so know? much funny stuff.
It, I mean, well, do, do you remember that they had to change the arrangement of the rallies because they used to have uh, Jay-Z play before Hillary Clinton and then everybody would leave <laughs> before she gave her speech. <laughs> so they had to change it to where she gave her speech first just so the crowd wouldn't leave. They were just there for the free show. And uh, and then, I mean, my favorite thing about the <laughs> Elizabeth Warren tape is when Trump comes on and says, why did you thank your husband for being there? It's his home. It's where he's supposed to be. It's like she's so cringy and unnatural. But, you know, I think this, uh, you know, I think these lyrics are a good thing. I think that could actually make a really good chant at a Kamala Harris rally is, is <laughs> B-word, sit down, B-word, sit down. I, I think that's exactly what people should be chanting when she gets up on stage. It, it works perfectly. Right. I mean, she's the one pushing the song and promoting it. Right. So, oh Harrison, gosh. I have a question for you. Because okay. I, my mind has been on this 2020 election season and what we're going to be seeing happen. So who do you think is likely to run on the Democrat tickets? Obviously, we're going to have a bunch of Democrats right out the gate. But who do you think some of these people are going to be? And who do you think actually has a fighting chance to take on Trump in a 2020 campaign? Uh, honestly, I think it's still too early to tell. I don't think Kamala Harris really has a chance because of of the corruption because she's just also insufferable like if you want i was talking earlier about you know this this uh this girl from this video who just puts on this very like but your red hat hurts people so you need to stop and it's just this like attitude and kamala harris has the same she's like saturated in this attitude where everything she says is just like you, you can almost hear her like you can hear her inner monologue like i'm so awesome the whole time like yes Yes, I'm just so brave. This is so and it's like her her uh uh I don't know what to put it like self self aggrandizement, her her self-worth is just it just oozes out of her totally unearned. She's this righteous holier than thou figure. So I I don't think Kamala Harris really has a chance. I think Elizabeth Warren, I mean she announced her thing, she did that cringy video and we haven't heard anything from her. So I don't think she's going anywhere. I don't think they really have anybody good. I think Hillary Clinton is probably waiting in the shadow. She's visiting Puerto Rico, you know, uh, uh, still out there as if she's campaigning. So she might be on the ticket as well. Uh, and that's right. I, you know, she hasn't ruled out that she won't run. I mean, she's right. refused to rule out a run for 2020. And we know that Hillary Clinton, she acts like a psychopath. In my mind, I think she's a psychopath. So I don't think she's going to be giving up on her goal, which is absolute power and to try to become the president of the United States, because, hey, then she can have the most pay for play power ever. It will be yeah. beyond the Clinton Foundation. So I think Hillary Clinton will try to run. I, you know, there are so many other people. What do you think about Bernie Sanders, though? Because I, for one, think that Bernie Sanders would actually make a strong candidate against President Trump because of how well he did last time around and how upset many Democrats were when Hillary yeah. Clinton stole the nomination. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but in Philadelphia during the DNC, there were massive crowds of protesters. Oh, and and oh they God. were predominantly from the African-American community there in Philly. And they were just so mad and they hated Hillary and they wanted Bernie Sanders. So I mean, do you think Bernie would have a shot? Uh, first of all, I will never forget watching the convention and hearing during her acceptance speech the people shouting out you stole the election and then being drowned out they moved in noisemaker machine or noise cancellation machines to drown out the protesters it's this dystopian thing where they're acting like they're all celebrating but half the people are like enraged and clawing i mean that was such an amazing thing that anger is still very real uh, I talked about it in the last hour pretty extensively that I think that um, oh, so Bernie Sanders cannot run as a Democrat this year or, or in 2020 because they changed the rules to make it to where an independent, somebody registers as an independent, cannot run for the Democrats. So my theory, my prediction is that the socialists in the Democratic Party are trying to split the Democratic Party and they're either going to run Bernie or a Bernie acolyte in 2020 and uh, and and basically try to. Uh, defeat the the Democrats by circumventing the Democrats because as far as we know Hillary Clinton still has control of that entire infrastructure she got it corrupt uh, in 2016 she still has it folks all right folks Millie Weaver is with me and we're talking about uh, the 2020 election run I, I want to give you some headlines before we go back to that discussion uh, and Millie if any of these pop out to you we can uh, we can cover them but just to just to give you some news of what's going on in the world um, I believe uh, now the death toll is at four police officers shot to death 
during a um, raid, a drug raid in Houston, Texas. Uh, five of them were critically injured. And I believe at this point, four of them has, have died. A tragic, tragic story. Uh, just insane. Just as soon as they, they went up to knock on a door and as soon as they got there, bullets started flying. Utterly tragic prayers to those families and uh, God bless them and thank them for their sacrifice. Absolutely sick. In the same uh, time, we have this cold front coming through um, coming through all of America, really, in the north. It's, it's bitter cold and there are these new uh, coats called Canada Goose, I believe, Canada Geese. Something like that, but basically, there's a uh, an epidemic of people being robbed for their coats and left out in the cold. Uh, in in places like Chicago, six uh, robberies have taken the coats right off of people's backs. This is just the the level of of criminality that we are descending into as our our entire civilization collapses around us. You know, Robert Barnes, who came on the Alex Jones show last week and uh, revealed the names of the celebrities that he would be suing because they uh, falsely, falsely misrepresented the uh, Covington Catholic boys. He tweets out at Barnes Law, uh, Barnes underscore law. He says, since announcing his free representation of the Covington boys, the left has sent bomb threats to my office, tried to hack my social media accounts, sent false reports to my credit agency, filed false reviews on lawyer sites, and claimed they could trigger illicit audits. So we see the tolerance of the liberals there when they smear and defame children and somebody tries to defend that child, well, that person suddenly needs to fear for their lives, or for their life, rather. 130 ISIS fighters are going to be brought back to France. Good. France needs them, obviously. Just absolutely ridiculous. Another pipeline, fuel pipeline, has exploded in Mexico. The last one killed 115 people, but there's no news of deaths from the newest explosion, but this is just another uh, symptom of the utter collapse of Mexico. I mean, America is descending down a bad road, but Mexico is already there and uh, just absolutely total anarchy in that country as just this this practice of puncturing fuel lines to milk them and steal the oil uh, is not only crippling their economy and crippling their, uh, you know, uh, gas trade, but is causing massive explosions and just tons of trouble for uh, the, the authorities there in Mexico. And then we have, of course, hundreds of migrants Cross the Arizona border after several busloads drop them off in Mexico. So literally, once again, we have billionaires and non uh, NGOs paying for buses to move um, illegal immigrants in. And then finally, we have the Congressional Budget Office saying the economy lost $11 billion during the shutdown. So they didn't want to give us 5.7 for the wall. So instead, they robbed us of $11 billion by refusing to play ball. So th those are just some headlines. You can find the full stories at Infowars.com. Let's get back to this 2020 uh, race because, Millie, no matter who runs and who wins, one thing we know for sure is that targeting the bank accounts of rich people is going to be their number one priority. We have Elizabeth Warren coming out and proposing a wealth tax on Americans with more than $50 million in assets, very similar to a, uh, a wealth tax that was put out in France. And now 12,000 millionaires per year are moving out of France. That's the result of this wealth tax that is very similar to the one that Elizabeth Warren is proposing. So, Millie, we know one thing's coming down the line, no matter who's running, socialism. So we have that to look forward to. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, pretty much everyone who's considered to be somewhat of a contender right now would be really bad if they won and they got into power. And we know that the Democrats right now who are already so emboldened to come out and call for hate mobs and violent mobs against conservatives and to violently attack conservatives, I think that it'll only get worse if we have Democrats in power. Now, it's interesting, there was a Washington Post ABC News poll that was recently released on Tuesday, and it actually said that over half of Democrats who were polled said they didn't really have a specific contender or candidate in mind that they wanted to support or vote for. But who ranked the highest among support was actually Vice President Joe Biden, or former Vice President Joe Biden. And he had the highest amount of people saying they wanted him. And next in line was uh, Camilla Harris. And I wonder if that has something to do with her recent um, release and an announcement that she was going to be running. People have already started to you know, think of her as a potential candidate. And then we had Bernie Sanders come in and 
Some people said they wanted Bernie Sanders to try to run again. And then 3% said they wanted Texas representative or former, I don't know why they're calling him former Texas representative, but really he tried to run and he lost against Ted Cruz, Beto O'Rourke. So people well, want to was, see him try to run. He was a congressman. He was a congressman. So, you know, okay. he didn't do anything. Okay. Nobody knew who he was. I mean, <laughs> but he, he was just technically didn't have a, a big congressman. Name, I guess. He didn't really <laughs> right. have much of a name. So, um, and then 2% said Elizabeth Warren and Michelle Obama. So it looks like most people are actually going toward Joe Biden, who might be seen as a little bit more moderate of a Democrat. I really don't see anyone in there saying Hillary Clinton, though. That's the funny part. But we know that the DNC, the Democrat Party, is going to try to shove Hillary at Americans again, despite the fact that most Democrats don't even see her as a contender or a possibility. Um, but really, Joe Biden looks like he might be one of the stronger tickets here for Democrats. And that's scary all the same. Uh, really, Joe Biden, we know he's a globalist sellout. He's a globalist hack. Um, he will be pushing and implementing um, plans and things like Obamacare, trying to get that back up and running again. Um, he'll be pushing things. And he has yet to rule out whether or not he's going to run. And well, recently... And Here's Recently, something that, he came out saying that he is coming closer to a decision, meaning we might be hearing from him pretty soon as to his announcement on the matter. If, if he knows what's good for him, he probably won't run because, my God, we will destroy that man with our memes. The the meme warfare against him. I mean, the guns are already loaded, <laughs> stocked, uh, you know, cocked and, and ready to go. Figurative well, one guns. Of the things that's interesting, CNN, I'm talking about is figurative guns. Never underestimate the power of soy. Uh, basically, <laughs> Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's statement couldn't be more true when it comes to the Democrats to essentially use this, this rage that women have and that these, these soy boy feminists, male feminists have um, against their opponent, essentially. So what we're going to see here is that I really believe that a woman candidate is needed on the Democrat ticket to really and, you know, get these women enthusiastic about voting because they would vote for someone for as simple of a reason as their what's between their legs, believe yeah. it or not. And Joe Biden is a white male. So yeah. they're they're going to attack him for that. And, and that's going to be one of his weaknesses in running, which is really silly to think about that that would be considered a weakness. But to them, to the Democrats who are caught up on identity politics. Oh, yeah, you better bet it. And I mean, every time you go to one of these woman marches, and when I would leave the march, I would literally see so many empty Starbucks coffee cups. It was insane, <laughs> like just everywhere. And it got me wondering, what is going on here? Why, why are all these rabid, crazy feminists drinking Starbucks and drinking coffee, these coffee drinks? And most of them had soy. I mean, yeah. Never Maybe. underestimate the power of soy. And we know oh that gosh, um, coffee that. does have, um, it, coffee actually induces more estrogen in the body. And right. that's why we at InfoWars, we sell supplements like uh, Super Male Vitality, who, which is going away pretty soon. But these things are important so that, especially for men, you can block those estrogen mimickers in, their, in your body so you don't turn into a soy boy. And for women too, because too much estrogen dominance in women makes them crazy. They act like, wild, hysterical, emotionally charged nutbags. And that's what we're seeing on the left. Now, that would be very sexist, except, you know, it, we're saying it because we want them to vote that way, right? We're saying they're, they're crazy and hysterical, and, and so vote for us. Use that, channel that rage, yes. Accept the rage. Feel the anger. Let it empower you. Yeah, the Democrats are the dark side, in case you haven't realized yet. They're literal Sith. Here's a fun factoid, ladies and gentlemen, as we're talking about Joe Biden potentially running for president. Did you know that he wrote the Patriot Act? Bet you didn't know that, did you? You might. You're InfoWars fan, so you, you know more than the average person. But tell that to your liberal friend. Tell them, uh, tell them what they think when you let them know that uh, Joe Biden is the one that wrote the, uh, the legislation that would become the Patriot Act. Yes, he is in the swamp. He is a key member of the military-industrial complex and is just as uh, controlled as the rest of them. But Amelia, I, I want to move on to talking a little bit about health, especially, you know, I have these two stories. There's a study from Fox17.com. Study increased screen time in young children associated with developmental delays 
and we already know this sort of intrinsically, but it was a new study, studied uh, over 2,000 mothers and children, and says for each age group, children with increased screen times showed poor performances on developmental testing when they reached the next age group. Developmental evaluations include communication, gross motor, fine, uh, fine motor skills, problem solving, and personal social skills. So yes, you're, you are mentally handicapping your children by allowing them to be on the screen so much, which wouldn't be such a problem, except we have this other article from today from the Daily Mail. Generation of child web addicts, youngsters are becoming so obsessed with the internet that they spend more time on YouTube than with friends. And here's the, here's the confusing part to me. As parents struggle to keep control of their online usage, and it says YouTube was a near permanent feature in many children's lives used throughout the day, but many children who go online to watch harmless videos find themselves watching deeply disturbing material. Search Elza Gate or Spider Man Elza. There is incredibly creepy stuff on YouTube. And as this article points out, they find it by YouTube's algorithm actually uh, leading them to it. And it is, I mean, these, these videos are disturbing beyond belief. Some of these videos that are made for children uh, that are, they feature the children's most favorite characters in just the worst, I mean, like grotesque, violent, sexual, uh, uh, you know, activities. This is for children. And a lot of times these videos have hundreds of millions of views because parents are not paying attention. And so that, that's what really confuses me is in this final uh, paragraph says, despite these fears, many parents of teens admit that they struggle to control the amount of time their children spend online. I have to be honest, I don't understand this. I grew up with the internet. When I was a kid, I had a computer. I loved computer games. I loved being on the internet. I did all that. Y you know what my parents did? They locked me out of the house. <laughs> They'd say, nope, screen time over. Get out. Go do something fun outside with your friends. And it might piss me off for a minute or two, but Within five minutes, I was at the park, you know, throwing water balloons at cars or doing God knows what else got me into trouble. But how is it difficult to control screen time for your child? They're a child. You are the parent. You're allowed to dictate how they spend their time, especially if it is handicapping them mentally what they want to do. Now, I don't know. I, I, I'm not speaking as a parent. So, Millie, I'd love for you to, to weigh in here. It, what's going on that parents just have just given up on controlling their kids and now just just hand it over they're like well the state will control my kids and uh, and youtube will teach them everything that they know and they don't need friends because they can pretend to online it's sick it's crazy what, what do you think millie it's because right now uh these ipads essentially are the best babysitting devices out there for parents i really mm. believe that most of the time i've seen so many parents actually buy ipads and there are special cases that you can put on these ipads so that your child who is not even mature enough to be able to handle one of these devices without breaking it won't break and destroy this expensive device but really it's so that they can keep their kids in a mind-numbing state just sitting there like zombies staring at a screen um so that they don't have to actually engage with them get them to do activities you know it used to be when i talked to um you know my grandparents and other people like that you know back when they were kids parents just let their kids run around the neighborhood and they hoped they came back you know and they didn't right. have as much issues with creepy predators and people that wanted to kidnap kids and abduct them and do horrible things to them so i think that part of it is that we have so much fear constantly surrounding us with all these horrendous media stories where we hear about child abductions and and pedophiles and and people that want to hurt your kids and do bad things to your kids that most parents are afraid they're terrified they keep their kids indoors and then they just put them on these devices to essentially sedate them into yeah. this mental coma and yes like you were saying there there have been ted talks there have been many uh you know documentaries and videos that that you know, really show that there is an issue with YouTube and some of these apps that are out there where one minute your kid is watching Mickey Mouse and next thing you know, it, it takes them several videos down the line and they're watching Spider-Man drowning their, their friends or, you know, drowning a princess or something, something violent, something horrendous or something sexualized. And this is becoming all too prevalent. And the real question is, why isn't YouTube going after these videos instead they're going after conservatives and adults engaging in political mm -hmm. speech and political satire they've prioritized attacking adult political speech 
and they could care less about all the sexualized, horrific, violent content that kids are being exposed to on YouTube. You know, one of the things, this topic really hits co close to home because my son is, you know, he's young, he's about four years old now, and I've let him watch YouTube. And next thing you know, there's an advertisement popping up on YouTube and it's got some man walking around in high heels talking about his, you know, gender fluid homosexual lifestyle. And I'm like, how is this ad wow. put on children's videos? You know, I walk in the room and I, I hear this guy talking and I see this, I'm like, what is going on? And my kid's just not even paying attention to it because he's like, this is boring. I'm playing with my pirate ship toys. But you know, the reality is it's going into their brain, it's going into their subconscious, they're hearing it regardless, and it's disturbing. It's, it's yeah. quite frankly disturbing. And these videos, I mean, you, you just saw one, if you're a television viewer, you just saw something being played on there that was a little bit creepy. Some of these, I mean, I don't even like describing them. That's how creepy they are. And if you think I'm exaggerating, search Elsa Gate, search Spider-Man Elsa on YouTube. It's something that, that any child would search. It's their favorite characters and what you're presented with are literally graphic, gruesome, sexualized, and violent cartoons made for children algorithmically with these weird ro robotic, uh, uh, you know, voices and, and just creepy stuff that have hundreds of millions of views and are monetized. Somebody's making a huge amount of money off this and YouTube definitely knows that this is happening. In fact, they will pull down videos that talk about it happening. But they won't pull down the actual videos. They put in this, this new uh, thing to, to counteract disinformation by eliminating all conspiracy theories, which basically means if you aren't the mainstream media, you don't get to have a voice on YouTube. That's what they're focusing on while they are literally destroying the minds of children, corrupting the innocence of children's minds irrevocably. I mean, you can't go back and, and unsee the stuff that these kids, as you say, are, are presented by YouTube, by their algorithm, or as advertisement, right? They, they remove your video if you talk about 9-11 uh, and say it's not advertiser-friendly. Meanwhile, you have, like, advertising the homosexual lifestyle on children's videos. It it's, cannot be an accident. They know that this is happening, and they are allowing it to happen because it feeds into their entire... A strategy of just destroying the minds of children, sexualizing children, and all you have to do is look at, you know, Steve Jobs and all these people who are responsible for this technology that refuse to allow their kids to have it. There are elite schools with millionaires and billionaires send their kids that do not allow the kids to have any sort of electronics because they it's, know how damaging it is. It's not just the videos too, Harrison. It's the apps as well, and where they yep. get you with the apps is the little ads that pop up. So there'll be little like five second, 10 second ads. And these ads are showing kids how to clean their eyes with glass or showing sexualized images to kids. And the parents will say, oh, well, look at all these apps on my kid's tablet. Everything looks PG, you know, G or whatever. It looks kid safe, but it's not because little ads are popping up throughout their playing experience and just exposing them to sexual traumatization and exploitation or just horrendously, you know, horrendous violent acts. Now, I do want to break some breaking news here because I know we're coming to a close, but this needs to be put out right now. Um, InfoWars is on, on the ground in Washington, D.C. with Roger Stone, who has officially pled not guilty to the seven felony charges that were brought forward by special counsel uh, Robert M Mueller. So that is news right there. And also, um, the next hearing is set for Friday, February 1st at 1.30 p.m. So that's something that we're going to be wanting to follow uh, because Roger Stone is under attack and InfoWars is under attack. And we need your guys' support more than ever right now. We need you guys to get on the horn, go to the website, uh, go to InfoWarsStore.com, get some stuff for yourself, for your friends, your family. Uh, we, we help Roger Stone. Roger Stone needs help as well with his legal defense fund. But man, we are fighting the fight against the globalists and don't think that the globalists aren't gonna kick back when you're fighting against them with everything you have here. So please support us. Please go to InfoWarsStore.com. Thank you so much, Millie Weaver, for joining me. It's a crazy fight, folks, but you gotta get in it. InfoWarsStore.com. We need to go back and revisit the foundations of our freedom. 
Our freedoms don't consist of the things that are enumerated on a piece of paper. It consists of the things that we're willing to fight for. The First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, the rest of the Bill of Rights are prohibitions. They're prohibitions against powerful organizations and individuals taking those God-given rights from us as individuals. You better understand that because they're taking them right now. We have seen what they want to do. They called it UN Agenda 21. Now they call it the UN 2030 Agenda. They want everybody off of the rural lands. They want people out of the suburbs. They want to pack everybody into the cities because that's where it is easiest for them to control everyone. Never missed your show any day. Well, I, mean, I mean, never.